All right. Nargis, do you have any brothers and sisters? Brothers. You got brothers, older or younger, or both? Yeah. Both. Nice. So then you probably learned Le Chatelet's principle when you're like three or four years old, right? Yeah, sweet. Sweet. That's when I learned it. So, and I learned it from my older sister. Because my older sister, she used to like, when I was little, pull my hair out. I blame her, first of all. So, and I'm not even joking. She told me to pull my hair out. So, because she couldn't let me have a good time. So if I was, you know, chilling, I'm your younger brother. So like, she had a couple years on me. But when I was a baby, she just like, I don't got jealous or something because I was so good looking, you know, it's never changed, but, you know, no, I think she just got jealous of not being the baby of the family anymore, and she'd come and pull my hair out and be all mad and angry and stuff when she was like two years older, so, uh, and the thing was, is I learned about Le Chatelet's principles right at that age, because my sister would come and pull my hair, and guess what I would do? Well, when I was really little, all I'd do is scream and cry, because that's all I knew how to do, right? That's all you do, scream and cry, but when I got older, you know, then you start to retaliate a little bit. That's Le Chatelet's principle. When you put a stress on a system at equilibrium, it will respond to counteract that stress. So me counteracting the stress of my sister pulling my hair was originally screaming and crying. Then it turned into biting and hitting and, you know, and then it just went downhill. So actually my sister, you know, just picked on me and beat the crap out of me all the time. I got five years old, so she was seven. And all of a sudden now it wasn't such an unfair fight anymore. Dude, laid a hand on my sister once, never again, right? I found out that boys aren't allowed to hit girls. Girls could hit me all day long, my sister anyways, till I was five years old, but never happens the other way around. Never touched her again. Got the lesson, got the hint. All right, so Le Chatelet's principle. We're gonna look at this reaction in particular for Le Chatelet's principle. So in this case, I'm gonna let this reaction reach equilibrium. So, and now I'm going to, all of a sudden, increase the concentration of O2. Now the first part is that if I place a stress on a system at equilibrium, a stress is defined as anything that takes the system out of equilibrium. If I just increase the concentration of O2, does that take the system out of equilibrium? You bet. It's not at equilibrium anymore. And so now I need to counteract the stress. Well, the stress is that now I have too much O2 to be at equilibrium. I can shift to the right or I can shift to the left. Which one counteracts the stress of having too much O2? Shifting to the right. So by shifting to the right, I use up O2. My stress is I have too much. Great, let's use it up. Notice if I would have shifted left, I would have made even more O2. And that's not helping me out. My problem is I got too much. So in this case, we're going to shift this equilibrium to the right. This means that all of a sudden now, the net shift means we're going to start making more products and using up reactants until we get back to being at equilibrium anyways. The other way to look at this, as I like to look at this as like a great cosmic battle. And here are the two armies, and they're firing cannonballs back and forth. And one of the armies might be bigger, and one of the armies might be smaller, who knows. But if I've reached, if I've reached equilibrium, then for every cannonball the reactants sent over to the products, the products are shooting one back. And it's equal rates going back and forth. Again, one army might be bigger than the other, but they're shooting cannonballs at equal rates. Well, all of a sudden, I come along, and I look at their army, and I say, die, and I kill their whole army, gone. I killed the carbon monoxide army. They're gone. Reduced them all the way gone. Does that change how fast we're shooting cannonballs from the reactant side? No, still shooting them at the same rate. Is there anybody to shoot cannonballs back? at that moment. Not at all. And so I'm still shooting cannonballs this way, but we're not shooting any back. Reactants are still turning into products, but if I took all the products out, there's no products to go back to reactants. And so in this case, the forward rate would be bigger than the reverse rate, which means a shift to the right as well. So, and again, you can also look at it as counteracting the stress. If I just took all the CO out, then I don't have enough CO to be at equilibrium. And if I don't have enough, then let's make some more. So another shift right here. So what if I add a bunch more carbon into the vessel? Which way is it going to shift? Which way? Not going to happen. Why not? So, and why does it being a solid mean no shift? That's what we told you. 
Cool, because it's not a stress. Why is that not a stress? How did we define stress again a minute ago? Anything that takes the system out of equilibrium. If we let the system reach equilibrium, then it reaches this perfect ratio to beat equilibrium. If I add more carbon, have I changed that ratio? No, nope, then we're still at equilibrium. If we're still at equilibrium, then we're not going to shift. So here's the deal. A solid will not shift the equilibrium at all, ever. It cannot shift the equilibrium. Now, let's look, though. So he can't cause a shift. He will be affected by a shift, though. So notice, when we added more O2 and the reaction shifted to the right, when the reaction shifts to the right, what does that do to the amount of carbon present in the vessel? Well, if we're shifting to the right, that's going to be getting used up. And so it's going to reduce it. So by adding O2, we caused a shift, and carbon, the solid, was affected by it. But when I actually add carbon to cause a shift, I can't cause one. It doesn't cause a shift, but it will respond and be affected by somebody else causing a shift. Cool. The one other thing you need to know about this reaction, if I don't give you this next piece of data, you can't answer my next question. The other thing you need to know is that for this reaction, so delta H is equal to negative 300 kilojoules. Negative 300 kilojoules. What does the fact that delta H is negative mean again? It's exothermic. What is true about an exothermic reaction? How would you de describe it? Yeah, it releases heat, releases energy in the form of heat. And if heat is released, that's the same thing as saying that heat is produced, which means heat is a product. And so in this case, heat is over on the product side. It's not a reactant over here. It's only a product over here. It's a reactant in the reverse direction. Notice if the forward direction is exothermic, the reverse direction is endothermic. Okay. So my next question is I'm going to increase the temperature in the reaction vessel. I'm going to increase the temperature in the reaction vessel. If I'm increasing the temperature, then what, what, what must I be adding into the vessel? Heat. I'm adding a bunch of heat. And if I'm adding a bunch of heat, I'm adding a bunch of a product. And if we add a product, which way does it shift? To the left. To counteract the stress. So when you add heat, a couple ways to think about it. Adding heat always fables, fables, favors the endothermic direction. Which direction was endothermic, forward or reverse? Reverse. So adding heat favored the reverse direction because it's the reverse direction that's endothermic. So cool. Lowering the temperature would have shifted to the right, vice versa. So the other one that really confuses students is this guy. If we increase the pressure. Now when I say increase the pressure, we should realize how I'm increasing the pressure. How do we typically increase the pressure on a system? Decrease the volume. So increasing the pressure would mean the same thing as decreasing the volume. Take those as synonymous right now for this context. Cool. And so that can be a stress on the system as well. So if you look, the ideal gas law, if you guys recall, if you plug and chug with PV equals NRT, one mole of any ideal gas at STP, standard temperature and pressure, has what volume? Anybody remember? 22.4 liters. 22.4 liters. So notice how much volume would one mole of O2 gas take up at STP? 22.4 liters. How much volume would two moles of carbon monoxide gas take up at STP? So 44.8 liters, twice as much, two moles of gas, right? So here. The thing to remember here is that gases take up way more volume than solids or liquids, like 1,000 to 10,000 times more. And so if I'm trying to figure out, OK, how much volume do the reactants take up and how much volume do the products take up? Well, ignore the solids and liquids. They don't take up much at all. It's focus on the gases. And so pressure effects, or pressure or volume effects, affect largely gases. Solids and liquids aren't all that compressible. They don't change their volume a whole lot when you jack up the pressure. But gases totally do. And so in this case, what takes up more space, the reactants or products, in these stoichiometric amounts here? The products. There's two moles of gas, whereas here there's only one mole of gas. So my stress now is that I don't have as much volume as I did when I was at equilibrium a second ago. And if I don't have as much volume, then which way do we shift? Toward the side that takes up less volume. 
So if I would have done the opposite, if I would have raised the volume, well then let's fill it. You know, if I increase the volume, fill it. Shift to the side with more volume. So, so lower volume, shift to the side with lower moles of gas. More volume, shift to the side with more moles of gas. And so in this case, lower volume, the side with left, less moles of gas is towards the left, the reactant side. So we shift left here as well. Cool, yeah, if it was equal number of moles on both sides, then this wouldn't cause a shift at all. Question? Ooh, so if you look at that though, how many variables are in PV equals NRT? Well, assuming that we keep the moles of gas constant, assuming that's constant, how many variables are in PV equals NRT? P, V, and T, R is a constant, right? So here's the deal. P and T, we're saying, are proportional, right? If everything else is held constant. If, which means if we hold the volume constant, then I can compare pressure to temperature. If I hold the pressure constant, then I could compare volume to temperature. So, but you notice you can't say that P and T are always proportional. They're only proportional if you hold everything else constant. So you can't quite say that. All right. So what if I add a bunch of an inert gas, like say argon? Argon, noble gas, noble gases have almost no chemical reactivity. So it's an inert gas. It's not going to react with anything in our reaction here, none of these species. So if, what if I add a bunch of that into a rigid container? It's a fixed volume. If I pump a bunch of gas into a, you know, that container, what's going to happen to the pressure? It's definitely going to go up, which is why this is tricky, because even though the pressure goes up in this case, we don't get a shift at all. Now this is tricky. Now if we look, we need to compare these last two situations and see what's going on here. Because here we said raise the pressure caused a shift. And here we said adding an inert gas, which, inert gas which will raise the pressure doesn't cause a shift. Well, we accomplished that raise, rise in pressure in two different ways. So let's say that you guys are reactant and product molecules in a reaction. So college students are reactant and product molecules. Cool. And so you guys are a certain number of moles of gas in a certain total volume, this room. Let's say we move this, re this, this review session into the men's restroom. It has one stall and one urinal. It's not big. Women's restroom, really nice. I don't know why they do that. Lots of room. But men's restroom, not so big. We're going to move all of you into the men's restroom. At least we're going to try until nobody else fits, right? So here's the deal. Will the number of moles of gases, in this case, change by moving you guys into the men's restroom? No. Will the total volume change? You bet. Then will the moles per liter, the molarities, change? You bet. The moles are the same, but the liters changed. And so by putting you in a smaller volume, the molarities all increased. And in this case, because there's molarity squared, whereas on the bottom there's only molarity, the numerator is going to grow faster than the denominator, and I'm not going to be at equilibrium anymore, and I need to shift. That's when we reduce the volume. Well, this option here, instead of moving this review session into the men's restroom, I'm going to keep it right here. S keep you guys all the same, but instead, you guys, the college students, I'm reactants and products, moles of gas, I'm going to let 2,000 animals from the local rescue shelter into this room with you. 2,000 dogs and cats, good times. Being that they would represent gas molecules as well, inert gas molecules in this case, they're not college students, but they are moles of gas, would the pressure in this room change? Yeah, you bet. A lot more moles of gas in the same volume, pressure's going up. Would the concentrations of college students change? Nope, same number of moles of college students, same total volume, the moles per liter of college students doesn't change. That's what's happening here. And if the concentrations don't change, then we're still at equilibrium and no shift. Cool? These are the six types of questions I might get. I might look at, you know, how reactants and products changing their concentrations cause a shift. Don't forget solids don't cause a shift. I might look at temperature and pressure changes, if I've provided you with delta H anyways. And then I might try and slip an inert gas one on there. No shift for him either. That's Le Chatelier's principle. Any questions?